Good morning. I'm Tony Addy, CEO and founder at Phononic. Uh, I adjusted my talk a little differently from that introduction in that I, I took very seriously, one, the seven-minute mandate um, for life lessons, so I better not come short or that would be embarrassing for what I've done with my life. But the second is I really wanted to call specific examples from Phononic's history to share, particularly with the entrepreneurs in the room, um, so they can avoid some of the missteps that, that we've settled upon or that we've, that we've faced. I've spent 15 years of my career uh, first as a very average research scientist, as my engineers remind me today, uh, then as a venture capital investor, um, and then as an entrepreneur in rev residence, and ultimately as an executive and entrepreneur in the energy and technology space. When I first started coming out of USC in Southern California, we didn't have the clean tech moniker. It was just alternative energy or energy. Uh, but I've spent my career investing in or leading or commercializing technology companies like Phononic. Where our story begins was in late 08 at a social meeting in Silicon Valley with what would become the two founding investors for our company, we discussed this profound yet simple investment thesis. Semiconductors, or as they're also known as solid state materials, have revolutionized our world. The transistor displaced the vacuum tube in the 60s, giving us the IT revolution, check the box on electrons. More recently, LED chips, and of course solar in the room is doing the same with photons, check that box. But there has not been that same transformative impact on cooling and heating. We are literally decades in, despite a whole host of problems. The compressor is still the incumbent technology of choice. There's got to be a better way. And being, looking at that investment theme, we discussed, wouldn't it be great to do something together in that space? So as a favor, I decided to investigate the technology that would give rise to our name, phonons. When you stand on top of a mountain and yell, you hear that echo. That is an echo of sound. Well, when heat travels through a material, particularly when induced by an electric current, that electric current carries phonons with it. It is a thermal sound wave. And how materials dissipate or handle those phonons determine their effectiveness in delivering cooling or heating efficiently. Well, I very quickly started my tour of what I lovingly refer to as all the liars and thieves in the industry. What I found is semiconductors actually had made inroads with heating and cooling, just very small. There was an industry called thermoelectric, around for 20 or 30 years, a $300 million a year or so industry, particularly used in electronics cooling where space constraints were important, but that not demonstrated the efficiency, namely the consumption of electricity and the generation of cooling, nor the scale to take on mass markets. So having met with more than a dozen universities in the US, I came back to Silicon Valley about two months later in the fall of 08, presented my findings to what would become our anchor investors, and said, all right, I get it. If my fund were to do an investment like this, we'd put in a million dollars, 12 months, we'd address the two or three technical hurdles, limiting the ability to compete with compressors. Don't even talk to me about a business. Hey, this was fun. I'm heading back to North Carolina. They made me spend the night. The next morning, they dropped a term sheet in front of me and asked me to found the company. The next day, I had to present to the Venrock and Oak Investment Committees, which happened to be the same morning that Lehman crashed. The market sold off 1,200 points, and I walked into these investment committees saying, do you want to do an investment with technology risk, science risk, market risk, geographic risk? Um, what's not to love? Uh, but, but, but thankfully, uh, in a sign of support, they backed us. Now, what every disruptive company or disruptive technology needs is credibility. So how do you get that? Well, what excited us is as we were moving through our technical hurdles associated with efficiency and scale, you find that the market opportunity is massive and diverse. Well, we all recognize big markets in this industry. But what was neat is if you look at the pictures on this screen, which represent not just different markets, but different industries, different price points, different, different go-to-market strategies, the temperature of heat that each needs to struggle with all falls within a pretty tight band of around room temperature to a couple hundred degrees C. Problematic for a mechanical system like a vapor compression unit, but right in the sweet spot for the thin wafer devices that we were developing at Phononic. This generates for the entrepreneur tremendous controversy because everybody's an expert when it comes to picking which market is the most appropriate first one for your technology. I've had some venture capital investors who I really respect give me advice that was crazy because some of the markets we went after didn't look sexy enough or neat enough 
for what, that they, for what they envision. Don't be afraid to call time of death and move on. We started looking at the electronics cooling and data server markets roughly four years ago. Their pain points are incredibly acute, yet they looked at us appropriately as a roughly 10-person company on the campus at NC State University working amongst three different labs, no Telcordia data, no JDEC data, no reliability, no operating protocols, no um, ISO certification, and we're going to boldly take down a significant percentage of their business, we didn't have that credibility that we needed to establish. What we did find is the refrigeration and appliance industry drew us at record pace into their segment. Well, what was the secret? We made a compelling case as to how we could take down that incumbent technology, but also we wound up landing the one thing that every entrepreneur needs when entering a disruptive space, a customer who's just a little crazy. So I don't know the analogy in the utility space or some of the water or other industries that I've seen today, but it's incumbent upon you to present your value creation opportunity to that industry, but find that one customer who's just a little different than all the rest and wants to be innovative, and then zero in on that. And once we established that market credibility, we were able to come back to some of the other segments that you see on this slide, and that's what triggered some of the growth financing that we've done over the last 18 months. So having technical credibility based upon feedback from the market that in some cases was baked into technology-based milestones, don't fear them, provided that you as the entrepreneur create those technology milestones with your investors and know that they'll realize a value creation event, it builds a credible story to take to the market. What's the next step? Understand the pain points of your customers because sometimes they don't understand their own pain points. We pressure test our business model re regularly over the last 12 to 18 months. In what we call the cold chain, which is where the appliance industry falls, they're undergoing tremendous change. In the U.S. or developed countries, roughly 75% of our food and produce comes from the point of origin to your home in some kind of refrigerated cold storage or cold chain. In China or the developing parts of the world, that's barely 5 to 25%. Yet, at the residential market in China, the, the refrigerator penetration rate is 95%. So as the standard of living goes up, this puts tremendous pressure on the cold chain to maintain food preservation from that point of origin. Moving through, think of the, the dilemma in the world right now with vaccines and medicines. They're transported in dry ice as the means of delivering medic medicines and vaccines to areas of the world that don't have that good developed infrastructure. Surprisingly to us, on the, electric side, or the electronic side, all of the data that this room discusses is stressing the fiber. So Moore's law, biggest gate right now, is thermal management. And being able to effectively communicate to those customers on the, the pictures and the slide that we just showed built credibility for us to introduce our technology to the market. Now, what is that technology? We've innovated semiconductor materials and devices that are thin, that are small, but pump a tremendous amount of heat. That addresses the efficiency and performance question. The next step, the middle picture, which we affectionately refer to as the heat pump, is the ability to compound and scale that output of the semiconductor device such that it can rival compressors on anywhere from 80 to multiple kilowatts of cooling and heating. One of my investors used to constantly pound me, what's our unit of commerce? What's our unit of commerce? Our unit of commerce are high performance devices and consolidated heat pumps that displace compressors for cooling and heating in the markets that I just showed. But what was the most critical step we took as a company? Another controversial one is we built a robust systems team that in some cases ripped apart the product that the customer sent us, put it back together again to teach them to learn so we could sell more of our unit of commerce. In some cases, it came with expected consequences. We were able to profile the performance advantages of our components. In some cases, it was unexpected. We wound up redesigning that system and eliminated the Freon, eliminated all moving parts, increased reliability. Stuff that we had a hunch we could do, but weren't, right sure, weren't quite sure of until we actually built it. You're counseled as entrepreneurs to be careful with your resources and to zero in on that unit of commerce. But in our case, building that systems team was absolutely crucial. Because if you're going into an industry that hasn't seen a lot of change since the last century, expecting them to just come up to speed quickly on your technology is a bit of a leap. I'll never forget some of the roadshows that we took with our components. 
looking at Asian refrigeration engineers manhandling our components and having nightmares of what they were going to do to it when I left. And in one case, they actually drilled a hole in it, put a bolt and a screw in to put it into the back of the system. We could never let that happen in the market. So all that time and effort allowed us to define what it is that we make and what it is that we can license or OEM to others so that we can sell more of the value creation product that we deliver. This takes the right team, it takes the right investors, but more importantly, it takes the right go-to-market strategy. I've got an expression for every occasion at Phononic. With respect to the go-to-market strategy, we come in peace, but we come in peace as happy warriors. There are 200 million compressors sold annually for refrigeration and air conditioning, just residential and domestic, not even counting industrial and commercial applications. Our argument has to be a total product solution to that customer. But the argument we're making is I don't want to just take existing market share. If we're as good as we think we are and our products are truly sustainable, distributed, convenient, connected, our customers or partners or our company can look at obvious applications within the kitchen but then move to other areas of the home that OEMs would like to go into but can't typically because of the shortcomings associated with the compressor. So when you take this approach, you're very much non-threatening to the point where we're now in discussions with compressor companies who we're trying to displace, as well as appliance and consumer product companies who want to leverage our technology to establish new products on their own. And then the last piece that really surprised us was the electronics component. There's a whole world out there really nervous about what all of you are doing with the amount of data and content that's going into the home. Not just the amount, but the speed and the expectations that you have. It's no longer a 10 gigabyte world. It's 40 and 100 is on the horizon. And there, the answer is no longer to just build your data server farm outside of Niagara Falls. There's got to be another solution. And we have intended to leverage that as part of the consumer product story. So when you put all that together, that's where you really leverage the sustainability, the convenience, the efficiency, the network capability of these products. Now, if you're going to do all that, the last thing you want to do is position your products in low-end black plastic boxes that immediately compete on price. If we're going to deliver, if you as entrepreneurs are going to deliver this level of extra credit to your partners and your customers, the least you should do is try and do things differently. And in the case of cold storage or cold products, what we've done is innovated to the point where we can demonstrate different industrial or product designs that validate the go-to-market strategy that we just discussed. So the products that you see on this slide are real products in commercial development as we speak, some with appliance partners, some that we're introducing on our own. All of this benefited from the hard work we had to do over the last year teaching what would become our anchor customer in China. So when we surfaced this summer and saw the progress that we had made, we had supply chain, vendors, qualification, REL data, that one of my executives came to me and said, why the heck are we not selling into the medical, clinical, and laboratory market? Go make it happen. In less than two months, we went from an industrial design, brought the supply chain up, the product up, and landed a customer with one of the largest hospitals in the mid-Atlantic for the product that you see in the lower middle section of that box. We have to be able to disrupt the market in a friendly, happy warrior way by sharing our value proposition, but leaving no mistake to that customer that if they're not willing to move, we will move without them. And once you deliver that message, I think you'd be surprised at how quickly the purchase orders and the commitments come in. So lastly, I'm sensitive to some of the comments I've heard about clean tech or alternative energy being CapEx light, CapEx heavy. It doesn't matter. Deliver a clear and concise value proposition. Show that every dollar you're taking is going to deliver value to that market, and you will be stunned to see the capital that's delivered. In our case, we've built a 20,000 square foot manufacturing facility in RTP, North Carolina. We can support a million units a year of our semiconductor devices and scalable heat pumps on barely a couple million dollars in CapEx. We're very proud to say that we went from an innovative idea on the whiteboard at the University of Oklahoma as a virtual company to our first commercial order as a semiconductor device hardware play, as we were called, on less than 17 million in equity in four years. Once we demonstrated that credibility, we landed a $26 million Series C last December from not just venture investors, but institutional growth investors who are now coming back to us preemptively 
wanting to put more money into the company to go after the markets that we shared earlier in the presentation. And I think the most important point that was made by the gentleman who, who was a couple presentations before us, in building this team, we now have a 62-person company in North Carolina. We have one, one classically trained expert who had ever worked in phonon management at the material science level before. And he's a young kid that we pulled out of the University of Michigan who does all of our thermal modeling on the computer. Everyone else we brought in from different parts of the semiconductor or thermal systems and heat exchange world. And as one of my investors fondly said, and we're proud to report, we're sort of like the bad news bears of the semiconductor world. But when you think outside the box like that, I think you'd be surprised uh, at the progress that you can make in a relatively short period of time with a judicious use of capital. So I'm happy to share additional lessons because I have a lot more that are more painful that are best served over drinks. But with that, thank you for your time and attention.